Father, we come before you. desire to worship you, Lord. We come into your courts with thanksgiving and praise for all that you have done, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your cross. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that you shed upon the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, that there is more than just this life to look to, Lord, to look forward to. Help us live this life to the, our fullest. And help us, Lord, fulfill the destinies, Lord, that you have destined for us. And so, Lord, we come before you right now.
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed
as he lives. God sent his son.
humble ourselves before you. Lord, reign, reign in our hearts, reign in this place. give you full control. I pray, Lord, that you would um, set our hearts ablaze, set our hearts on fire, Lord, for you. And may your words be spoken today, Lord. listening ears, Lord. A broken spirit and a contrite heart you would not despise. So Lord, we come broken before you. Contrite before you. offering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for all that you have provided for us. All that we have is yours. And we give back to you all the good things, the many provisions that you have given to us. We hold back nothing at this time. And the portion that we give to you now is but a small percentage of everything that you give to us. Father, our hearts are humble. We are grateful for your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have an offering you'd like to give, there are buckets to the either side of me. Go ahead and do that. spill coffee on my shirt. If you know me, it's, that's not an unusual task. <laughs> I, had a, uh, I had a meeting with a chief technology officer one time. We were doing this, um, I, I think it was like a $25 million deal. Um, and we had, uh, I, had a, I had a presentation, uh, another colleague of mine had his presentation. My presentation was about 15 minutes. And um, what I usually do is when I have a presentation, I go like 30 minutes before the start and I set the entire room up just to make sure, and I make sure everything is working. Because you don't want to be fumbling with things when you are presenting to an executive. And everything was working, and every, I had everything down. I had my cup of coffee right over here. And then I happened to just kind of swing my arm, and I had a white shirt on and a suit. Everything fell onto my, sh onto my white shirt. I had a Tide pen with me. I always carried a Tide pen with me. 
But the thing was just so drenched. I didn't know what to do. So I had 10 minutes. I ran into my bathroom, the bathroom. I took off my shirt, literally. I just washed it. <laughs> I pulled it out. I had one of those dryers, and I was drying my Oh, my gosh. I was reminded of that when I went into the washroom, and then I saw everything on me. That was one of the, um, we got the deal, in spite of what I, what I did. No, I had my jacket on. <laughs> I put my jacket on, and it was, it was a hot summer. I just put a jacket on, and, and I just plugged right through it. Fun times. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We ask that as we listen to your word today, that your word will ring true in our hearts and lead us to your wisdom and understanding. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to do something different today. I want to read a story. We're going to go through the entire book of Esther, right? And I'm going to interject my personal opinions and what God has given me about this book. And at the end, I'm going to draw some parallel comparison for us because I think the book of Esther is a book that is very appropriate for our time right now. We are living the book of Esther, in my opinion, at this time. And there are things happening around us that we will see that are in comparison, in parallel, to what the book of Esther says. All right. So we're going to read first in book of Esther, uh, chapter 1, but let me just give you some context on what's going on. Um, so this is the Persian Empire. This, at, this was at the height of their empire. So it stretched from, this is Greece here, and this is India, believe it or not. So, and this is Egypt down here, right? And right over here is Israel. <laughs> and where this story happens is, is Susa, all right? This is S-O-U, but in our Bible, it's S-U, right? But it's the same. And the story is happening right here, but the king, Xerxes, or as in the Bible, as it's written, and I, I'm going to botch this name. I've been practicing all week, Right? But I'm going to botch it. Okay? It's Ahe Ahas Virus. That's how you say it. Ahas Virus. All right? And he's a king here. And Esther plays a, becomes a queen in his, in his court. But this is the entirety of Xerxes' kingdom right now. Right? I think this is Turkey up here. This is Turkey here. Here is... Uh, Iraq, and here is Iran, Syria, this is Saudi Arabia here. It's a vast kingdom. And people say that per the Persian Empire was the, one of the, the first <clears throat> the world kingdoms in the history of the world. This, they were the first one. Right? And the Jews were in captive in this kingdom. And there, it's about 490 BC, right? So Babylonians, the Assyrians came first, the Babylonians second, and Medo-Persia is now the third kingdom, right? I would just refer to them as Persia, okay? Can you go on to the next, next slide? And here's our current, so I, I try to get a kind of a overlay Right, so like I said, here's Iran, here's Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. So it stretched from all the way here, all, all the way there. So it was a massive empire. And King Xerxes, or Aha, Ahas Rirus, as the Bible said it, he was king over this. Right? And one day, this king, this king, that had reigned over all of that kingdom, decided to throw a massive party. 
And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 1. Satraps. Satraps had reigned. Can you go back to the first one, Tom? Satraps would have reign over different regions. All these different names are regions. Right? So this is in, I think he wrote, it's in some other language. But Babylonia, um, Mara, Syria, all of these are different regions. And satraps had reigned over these regions. So he invited all the satraps and the conjurers and the wise men and different um, people that ruled over different areas of his region and decided to have a party. And this was a massive party. The party lasted for almost a half a year. Six months. Right? And they were just drinking it up. Those six months, there were two weeks. Put it over here. There were two weeks where he had a feast for the people in the, in the, in the, in the capital of Persia, which was Susa. Right. For two weeks, anyone in that capital can come and eat and drink. Right. And so in this time, as people were having to drink and having a time of their life, the king sends in his queen. He sends for his king, queen, Vashti. And Vashti was known throughout the region of Persia or the entirety of the world as Xerxes would consider as one of the most beautiful women in the, in the entirety of Persia. So after drinking much wine, you know what happens when men drink wine, right? And they start to talk, and they start to boast about their, do, about their conquering. They like to boast about their cars. They like to boast about their TV sets, their man caves, and whatnot. Right? And then comes the wife. Oh, I have the most beautiful wife in the world. And he calls for the queen to come into his court. Right? And Vashti is called in to, to, so that she, she can be walked around in the midst of all the empire's leaders for her beauty. So he wanted to make, literally, her a trophy wife. Right? And Vashti would not do it. To her credit, she said, I am not your concubine. I am not one of your harems. I am your queen. I will not obey your request. But there are consequences when you disobey a tyrant. And sure, let's make no bones about it. Xerxes was a tyrant. He was a dictator. He refused. The king was enraged. And he called all his counselors and said, what sh should I do? My queen will not listen to me. And his counselor set the stage for him to, take, to remove Vashti as his queen and to send her out so that she may never come back into his presence. Out of a drunken night, he decrees that he's his queen will never set foot into his court again. And in fact, he will never have another conversation with his queen. So he, she is cast off in, from his presence. And he, she is removed from all the works of being a queen. And we learn that through the, the series of events that this king, King Xerxes, has a tendency to make rash, unwise decisions based on emotions. And you will see that God uses this to his favor. Right? So here's a king that is a tyrant, authoritarian. He thinks that he rules all the world. And at that time, he thought that he was a god. Did you, ever, you guys ever watch the movie uh, 300? That king, Xerxes... It, that's the Persian king right, that, that you were reading about in the Bible. It, he was known to be very tall, very big, right? And he thought that he was a god. 
So he could reign and do whatever he wants, right? So in his drunken rage, he deposes the queen and sits alone in his throne. After a while, after the wine had all dissipated, he realizes he has no queen. A man, a king, and no queen starts to get lonely. So he wonders, what should I do? I need a woman. I need a wife. But I have vanquished my queen. What shall I do? And this is where we find ourselves in Esther 2. Let's read Esther 2, verses 1 through 5. As after these things, the things that we just described, when the anger of the king ah- Ahas Virus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the province of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Hege, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the woman, let their cosmetic be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the queen, king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So it's a search sent forth. There's a call out for the first beauty pageant, essentially. So all the, all the leaders are told that a king is looking for a queen, one that is beautiful. And everyone is told to be on the lookout for a beautiful woman. And then we read on in Esther chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. Now there was a Jew in, Su- in, the, um, in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, right? So a descendant of Saul, right? Who had been carried away from the Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Je- Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So let's set the stage here. Vashti is gone. A king is looking for a queen. So in the vastness of the empire that I just showed you, right, Esther comes into the scene. And Mordecai is not even Esther's mother, a father. It's his uncle, right? And this sets the stage of what is about to happen to Esther and to the Jews, right? Out Out of a king's heart, a desire for, to fulfill his fleshly desires, a queen is sought, sought out for. And this queen now comes into to the world stage to set and do the will of God in the coming chapters. So S- Esther is brought into the court, and she is set aside for one year. There are six different beautifying events that happens. For one year, she is beautified, and she befriends the eunuch that's in charge of the harem. And this, this friendship becomes a more than a friendship because, because the eunuch sees Esther as beautiful, and the eunuch has sway with the king. And not only that, the eunuch knows what the king likes. So the eunuch tells Esther all the things, all the inside information into winning this beauty pageant. And we read on in verse, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. 
this, that, that's not up here. I'll just read it myself. And when Esther was taken to king, I'll, I'll just say Xerxes, <laughs> into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is in the month of Tibet, in the, se in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than any other woman. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So, what is going on now? Esther becomes queen over the entire vast empire of Persia. Think about what a contradiction this, this must be. The Jews are taken into captive by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. A new empire comes in, the Persians. And from the midst of the captives comes a queen that will reign with the king over the entire kingdom. And there's purpose behind this. There's reason behind this. And there is a reason why all these things are happening. And Mordecai comes, in, come in, comes into play in this grand stage. So we have Mordecai, Esther, and the king. And later on we'll see Haman, right? But Mordecai is sitting at the gate. So, can, hey, Tom, can you go on to the next slide? So I'm, I'm a visual learner. So when, I, when I'm reading the king's gate, I have no idea what they're talking about. This is a throne room. This is where the king would be. This is the harem. This is where Esther started out. And this is where Morde uh, Mordecai is. He's in the king's gate. Most likely... Mordecai was an official, right? He had some kind of an official role for the king. We don't know what, what it was. To be here, he had access to everyone coming in. This was the entrance. This is how everyone came in. They came in through here. They had their official duty done here. And then they would have entrance here to the king up here in the throne room. All right? So it helps you to identify because... He, the, the book of Esther talks about Mordecai being in the king's gate, I think, 12 times, right? And there's a, there's a reason for that, right? There's purpose for that. And we find out the first purpose is in Esther chapter 2, verses 21 and 23. It says, in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Right there. Bigthan and Tarash, two of king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on king Aha, Ahas Wirush. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were hanged, both hanged, on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Note two things. Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. Esther told the king, said, Mordecai is the one that is giving you this information. That's important. It will come to, into play later on. Second thing, it is recorded in the book of Chronicles. That is also important. Later on, it will come to show. So Mordecai, sitting in the king's gate, hears about, hears about a, a, a plot to kill the king. He hears about this plot and tells Esther. Right? And Esther tells the king. And the plot is thwarted. And the two eunuchs are hung at the gallows. Right? So now, here is... The stage being set once again. Esther, a king that shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't have been a queen, right? Here's Mordecai sitting in the king's gate, and he has access to Esther only because she was brought in 
late after what has happened to Vashti. And here's Mordecai having a, because there is a connection between him and Esther, he is able to do a favor for the king. Right? Keep that in mind. And we read on in Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite. Haman is a, a, an official, a high-ranking official. Right? So now a new person comes into play. There's Esther, there's the king, there's uh, Mordecai, and there's now Haman. Okay? Promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Agagite is the, it's in the line of the Amalekites, right? Remember, the, remember in 1 Samuel 15, Saul was supposed to kill the Amalekites, but he saved King Agag, right? That's why they're called Ag Agagites, right? And advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. So Ham, Haman is moving on up. He's like the Jeffersons. You guys know the Jeffersons? No. <laughs> He's moving up. Ah, Nelson knows. <laughs> He's moving on up. He's moving up on the ranking here. And verse 2, And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. Right? Haman is now so important that when he comes out to the king's gate, people start to bow down to him, to honor. That's how high the king has made him in the right? And then um, for the king had promoted the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. We don't know why. Why? I have a feeling it's because of the same thing because of Daniel. It was the same thing. He was, he's a Jew, and he is not going to bow down to mere men and worship him as God. He refuses to do it, right? Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's word would stand, for he had told them that, that he, was not, he was a Jew. So listen to what's going on. People, people realize that Mordecai is not bowing down. Right? To individual men, this, they look at this, they observe this, and what they're saying is this, who is going to win? Here's Haman. Here's Mordecai. Mordecai is saying, I am a Jew, and I will not worship a mere man. I will only bow down to a king. And Haman is saying, I have been given, granted a command by my king, who is a god, that any time I come out, you will bow and give me respect. So there is a warfare already happening. Think about this. A warfare has started within the realm between Haman and Mordecai. Haman God and Mordecai's God. There is a rumbling already. And these individuals are wondering, I wonder who is going to win. Is it going to be Mordecai, or is it going to be Haman? That's essentially what the passage is saying. In verse 5, it says, When Haman saw right, that Mordecai did, did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But his disdain to lay hands on Mordecai, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So let me explain this. 
Haman realizes it is not only Mordecai that I despise. I despise his entire nation, his entire group of people. I want them gone. Think about that hatred. Right? Now think about what is going on in our world, in our nation right now. There is a direct correlation. There's a group of individuals that will despise another group of individuals because of what they believe. That is what is happening right now. What is sad is that most churches do not realize this. What is what is sadder is if we are not careful and we have discernment about what is happening, we will give up one of our rights. And we won't have the right to meet like this. You mark my words. This is where it leads to. We have to be discerning and we have to have wisdom in this hour because this is what's happening right now. The God of Haman and the God of the Jews are at war right now in the story. And in the same way, the God of Haman has once again come upon the face of this, wor this world. And he is fighting the God of the Jews, Jesus Christ himself. Let's read on. It's a little preview, all right? So why did Mordecai not want to bow down to Haman? I think we talked about that. Anger, Haman's anger shifted from just being a focus on Mordecai himself into an entire nation. And in this scene sets a blueprint for what is about to happen. What is about to happen in the coming chapters. Right? He sought, Haman sought a final solution. A final solution. You know who else thought of a final solution? Hitler himself. Isn't it interesting that the nation, the Jews, are always under attack? Hitler wasn't the first one to come up with a final solution. Haman was the first one to come up with a final solution. He was devising in his little brain of his that, okay, Mordecai, you are not going to bow down to me. I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to kill every one of your nationalities. Your Jews, every Jew will be destroyed under my command. Here is Haman's plan. Esther chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Who do, who do you think that certain people is? The Jews, right? He is setting up the king. Remember, this king is whimsical. He's emotional. He's rash. He makes brash decisions without any wisdom or discernment. We've already seen it. He kicked out his queen because he was angry at him at her because she would not flaunt her beauty in front of a whole bunch of men, like a, some kind of a concubine, some prostitute. Because of that, because of his anger, he kicks her out. So we already know this king is very rash and emotional. Haman is not playing against that emotion. Right? He's setting him up. Right? There's a certain people, their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. He's setting, him, setting the entire stage up so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 10, talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring. He doesn't even think about it. He doesn't even think about it. He just trusts 
that what Haman is saying is true, that there's a group of individuals that are going against the king's law, right? So the, he takes the king. Uh, so the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the Agagite, the, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month and, 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 and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the people, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's providence, provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children in one day, the 13th of the 12th month, which is a month of Adar, and to, the plunder, and to plunder their goods. Think about what just happened. In a second, in one minute, an edict is written. Not by the king, by Haman. All the king does is take his ring and sign it. And after an edict is written, it is now law. That's the way the Persian law goes. And after an edict was given, a command was written, and the, and the words were sent out to all the provinces to do what? To essentially kill every Jew in a single day. Think about how awful, how evil, and how wicked that law is. It came from a man's thought because another man would not bow to him. All because of little anger. Do you know what Haman did? Do you know how Haman convinced the king? He promised him 10,000 talents of gold, a silver. Do you know how much that is in today's time? It's about $300 million. Haman was essentially saying, I want to buy every Jew and kill them. Here is the money. And you don't read it, read it here, but the way Haman came up with that day, one day to kill, was he casted lots. He went by, he started in the month of January, first day, they would throw a lot. Then they would go to the second day. They, they would go to the third day. They casted lots until they came to the last month, the 13th day, and the lot came up. All right. And it's very interesting. If you look at this, we ask ourselves, where is God? Where is God? Where is, what is God doing? How can God allow a man to come up with an edict out of his own vengeance to kill an entire nation. And you have every right to think that. But you will see, as the, play, as the story is played out, God's sovereignty is everywhere in this story. All right. We read on. In Esther, verse, chapter 4, verse 1 through 13, Mordecai's response, when Haman... Mordecai hears of Haman's edict. This is his response. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went, in, went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate cloth, cloth and sackcloth. And, and in every province... Where, wherever the king's command and his de decree 
reached, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting and weeping and lamenting, many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. And I'm going to have to move on quickly here because we're running out of time. So essentially, Mordecai is mourning. An entire nation is mourning. And Mordecai, in Esther chapter 4, 8, reaches out to Esther. Esther is his only save. Esther is his last chance. And he's telling Esther, you must do something about this. You must tell, go to the king and tell him what is going on. Right? And we read in Esther 4.8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of the people. And then in Esther chapter 4, verses 12 through 17, we read, Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do you think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews? For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days and nights. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. I will go into the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him to do. So Esther decides that he's going to go, she is going to go see the king. But there's a problem with this. A queen cannot enter into the presence of the king without being summoned. If you enter into the presence of the king, these aren't my rules. These are the rules of the king, right? It seems ridiculous to me, but this, that, that's the way it is, right? So unless you are summoned, you cannot come into the presence of the throne room, right? And if you do, and the anger of the king May, dis- may kill you unless he reaches out with a scepter and grants you favor and you are allowed to speak. Right? And so that's why Esther was hesitant. And when Mordecai told her, do you think you will be safe just because you're a queen? What happens when people find out that you are a Jew? You will die. Surely you will die. And it's interesting what Mordecai says. The Jews as a nation will be delivered, but our family will certainly die. For you and I work for a king. I work for a king and you are a queen. When you are found to be a Jew, you will certainly die. So he calls for a fast for three days. And after three days, she approaches the king. And I'm going to go right through this, right, because we're running out of time. She approaches the king and goes into the throne room, most likely very afraid. After three days of fasting, she has enough strength to come into the king. And the king gives her the scepter of grace. And she enters into his presence. And then the king sees favor in her. I wonder why. Because most likely she's one beautiful and he's very vain, right? But at the same time, Mordecai, through Esther, has saved his life. There is favor upon Esther already that was already set up. And so when Esther approaches the king, the king shows her the scepter and gives her grace. 
And Esther approaches a king and says, O king, there is, a, there is, there is something happening. And, I, and then, excuse me, I jumped ahead. The king says, what can I do for you? To half the kingdom I will give you. Another rash statement. Again, the king, this guy is just emotional. He's all about emotions, right? He, doesn't, the, the, she, he sees the queen and says, I will give you half the kingdom. You are, I don't know, beautiful? Who knows, right? And Esther says, if, it's, if I have seen favorable in your eyes, would you please come to a dinner that I will have for you and Haman? Right? And the king says, most certainly, I will come and have dinner with you. Right? And Haman is told of this, and he is overjoyed. He's like, oh my gosh, I am in favor with the king, and the queen loves me too. She has invited me to have dinner with her. This is great, right? He is just in, on sky, cloud nine, and he's running, probably skipping out of the king's, king's throne room, and he sees Mordecai. And Mordecai would not bow down to him. And, and anger seethes within him. And he is so angry. And he goes back home. And we read in Esther, Esther 5, he tells his wife, everything that has happened, look what's happening to me, your husband. I am not only found favor before the king, I have found favor in the queen, and she has only invited me and the king to a dinner. But I am so angry at Mordecai. I can't even enjoy what great things that are happening to our family. Because Mordecai would not bow down to me. And his friend says, oh, this is awful. This is awful. You should build a gallow that's 50 cubits high and hang Mordecai in that gallow. Right now, today. Don't worry about waiting for the day where the Jews will be killed, you should just do it right now. Build a gallow and hang Mordecai on it. And Haman says, what a great idea. What a great idea. I'm going to build a gallow. Little does he know that gallow is not for Mordecai. It's going to be for him. Right? So the anger sees within him. He builds a gallow and he goes back and has dinner with the king with, the, with Esther, and as he's having, as they are having dinner together, the king asks, asks Esther, what can I do for you? What favor can I do for you? Right? And the king and the queen says, if you have found favor in me, come back tomorrow for another dinner. What is she doing? She's just buttering him up. All right. He's giving him drinks, probably giving him food, saying sweet, wonderful things to the king. Right. You are the most majestic king. You are so powerful. Look, look how tall you are. Look at all your muscles. Look at everything that you have. He, she is just buttering him up. All right. After drinking many wine, he goes back. And in the middle of the night... He can't sleep. So he awakens, and he wants to read the Chronicle of the King. So essentially what he's trying to do is read about all the good things that he's doing. So, you know, he's bored. So he says, bring me the squirrels, and I want to read about how great I am. Essentially, that's what it is. But as he's reading that, he reads about the scheme that happened recently where the two, two eunuchs try to kill him and reads the name Mordecai. And Mordecai was the one that brought light to that scheme. And the king says, has anyone given Mordecai a reward for his good deed? And no one could answer him. And he says, we must reward Mordecai right now. Is there anyone in the court right now? And lo and behold, there is someone and it's Haman. Haman comes into the king, and the king to ask Haman, what should I do for a man that has saved my life? 
right? And then the, Haman says, you should, robe, you should um, robe him with a royal robe, and you should put him on a horse, and you should parade him around the city as a hero, right? And the king says, good idea, Haman. You go get Mordecai, you put a robe on him, put him on a horse, and parade him around, for he should be justly rewarded. Haman, when he realizes what's going on, his countenance falls because he, the man that he's trying to kill is now being exalted. Think about that. Think about what's going on. So he runs out and does everything that the king tells him to do. After that, he runs home to his wife and basically says, we are dead because the man that I am about to kill is now being exalted as savior of the king. As he's telling her, her this, her, uh, his, his wife, all the story, two eunuchs come and says, you are wanted by the king. And take, they take Haman back to the king's palace and they have, and they go and have a second night of debauchery. And we read on. We read on the second night what was going on in Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. It says, so the king and the Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. This is the second night, right? Remember, the king, uh, Queen Esther said, come back, right? This is after Mordecai had been lifted, lifted up after finding what he had done. And verse 2, And on the second day, as they were drinking wine, after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your re request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. And the queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if... It please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. So Esther reveals Haman's wicked plan. And she says, save us, deliver us from the plan, from the edict that you have given we read on in Esther chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance to the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they, hung, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king was abated. So here's what happened. Esther tells the king everything that Haman had plotted. And Haman, realizing that he is about to be killed, runs to Esther to beg for mercy. The king, in his anger, right, his rash, his emotional, runs out of that, that dining room because he wants to get fresh air. He wants to clear his mind, right? As he's coming back, he sees Haman running after the queen. And he says, oh, would you in front of me attack my queen? You are to die today. And you, the eunuchs tell him that there is a gallow already prepared to hang somebody. Haman had it prepared for Mordecai. And the king says, oh, how appropriate. We will hang you now on that same gallow. Right? And we read on in verse chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. On that day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemies of the Jew. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king 
took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Mordecai becomes a replacement for Haman. Mordecai gets Haman's house. Right? Then Esther spoke with the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and the plot that he had devised against the Jew. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, if it pleased the king, if I had found fa favor in your sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his sight, eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letter devised by ha Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the province of the king. So let me speed up and tell you what, what happened. So Esther and Mordecai are saved. right? But Esther understands the edict is still standing. There is still an edict that on that one day, the last month, the 13th day of the last month, all the, in the, all the people in the province of Persia can go and kill the Jews without any repercussion. Right? Xerxes says to Esther, write whatever you want. I will put my signet ring on it. Just like what Haman did. Right? Haman wrote the edict and the king put his signet ring. Now it's reversed. And the king says, write whatever you want to save your people and I will put my signet ring on it. And so Mordecai now writes an edict, essentially saying every Jew on that day have the, has the right to defend themselves against anyone that would attack them. And not only that, they can plunder the individuals that they had attacked. Right? And this, pro this edict is now sent out to all the provinces. So, so, so essentially the table is now turned against everyone. And we read on in uh, Esther, verse, Esther 8 and verse, Esther 8 and verse, uh, I'm sorry, Esther 9, verse 1, chapter 1, uh, Esther 9, chapter, uh, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, Adar on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and the edict were about to be carried out on the very day, when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. We read also in Esther 9, verse 25, In Susa, the capital of Persia itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed, and I will not say these names. These are ten sons of Haman, right? They killed all ten sons of Haman. Let me give you a little backdrop about the sons of Haman. Why would somebody pay $300 million to kill a man and wipe out an entire nation? Here's my, here's my opinion. Mordecai is a descendant of Saul. Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites. What Haman was trying to do is revenge Saul's killing of the Amalekites. Saul had destroyed all the Amalekites and killed Agag himself. He was trying to avenge that, and his anger seethed within him. And that's why he wanted Mordecai and the entire nation of the Jews to be destroyed. And the reason why all the sons had to die was because in the same way, what did God command Saul to do to kill every one of them and do not take any plunder that was the order of God and this is what happens in Esther the sons of the Agagite the Amalekites are killed all ten of them and no one takes their plunder it's a fulfillment of God's promise God's commandment given 
to Saul being fulfilled many centuries later. Right? Right? Listen. In our world right now, in our world right now, God is not mentioned. In our media, in, our, in Facebook, Twitter, God is never mentioned. But God's sovereignty in what is happening in our nation is everywhere. There is fingerprint of God's sovereignty in everything that is happening in our nation. The reason why I bring this up is this, right? It may seem like Esther that we are at a disadvantage, right? We are losing the election. We are losing control over our rights as a church. We are losing our control of our First Amendment and Second Amendment rights. We, it's, it appears that we are at a disadvantage. But God's sovereignty reigns supremely. And not only that, if you read... Esther 4, 14. This is a very important chap chapter. Stay with me. I know this is long, but stay with me. For if you keep silent, this is Mordecai talking to Esther. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And, you, you, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I ask you, I ask you, have we not come to a place of this place for a such a time as this? We are at a crossroad in our country. Just like Esther, we are at a crossroad. Do not think, do not think just because God is sovereign, it does not mean that you will, you and I, we may, you and I will not feel the repercussion of a government that is against God. That is a government that is against the goodness of God and his statutes and the commandments. God's sovereignty is everywhere and God will take care of his own. But it does not mean that there is no collateral damage. That's why in Proverbs it always says, a righteous king brings peace. And the reverse is true. An unrighteous king brings discord. Just because God's sovereign does not mean that we can sit by and not care about who our leaders are and what they believe. It doesn't work that way. And we have come to a such a time as this to make a difference. Just like Esther, we must approach the king with cunning, with wisdom, and with our fear. And we must stand up and speak the truth that what is happening to our nation is wrong. It is terribly wrong what is happening. Everything that we hold dear to us is being taken away. An election, an entire election has been rigged. Can you imagine what, what nation is this that we are living under? I would have suspected this in a third world country. I would suspect this in South America, Central America, maybe in some other place, but not in the United States. We must stand and be courageous, for you and I have been called to this place for such a time. We have a purpose. There is a reason for why God has called us to this place. And I do not want to be dramatic here. And I, do not want to say, I did not want to say this. I'm not being dramatic here. So I'm going to bring my voice down. I was praying the other day. And God brought me. God asked me a couple questions. God asked me, what do you think the church was doing when Adolf Hitler was rising up? 
And I still, I, I said, I don't know. Right? They sat silent and did not voice their opinions. They sat silent and did not declare right, that what the nation is doing, what the politics, what the individual leadership is doing is wrong. And I asked the Lord, what are you trying to say? If we, if we are not wise in what we do in the coming months, in the coming weeks, in the coming days, we, we, we will allow tyranny. We will allow a governmental system into our nation that will take away every one of our rights. And just like Haman, it seeks to destroy those that are people of God. I don't think, you know, very recently, Tobias would attest to this. I was not, I was not into politics. I thought that Living the Christian life and politics rarely came cross path. I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that at all. If we are not vocal, right, in saying to our governments when they enact laws that are unbiblical, when they challenge and take away everything that is given to us not by other men, by God. And they challenge and take that away from us. We must stand up and say and voice our opinions. We have to voice our opinions. We have to take action. Because if we don't, we, 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 will, be, we will be counted as unrighteous. What we are seeing we have to declare it and say, this is wrong. This is wrong. We have to stand up and say, this is wrong. And we must take action. So how do we take action? We stand and fight. Every time we hear something, we, we hear from a friend, from a family, we speak the truth. We do not cower anymore. We cannot be afraid we cannot hide beyond the notion that Christians and churches should not be political because if we stand behind that, we will find ourselves just like Germany, a nation that has been taken over by a tyrant. I am not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. We have to be aware. You know, every time... Here's how I've taken action this week. When I hear, when I go and listen to YouTube on what is happening, there's always a disclaimer that comes up from YouTube. And that it says, do you want to give a feedback? I click on it. I give them a feedback. And this is what I tell them. You are evil. You are wicked. God will judge you for the lies that you are perpetrating. And you will be judged. Repent. And you will be saved. That is what we have to do. We have to stand and fight. If we don't stand and fight, it will be taken away from us. And you and I will sit in a corner of a lot with handcuffs and barricaded. I know that sounds drastic. I know. You must be thinking, Pastor Josh has lost his marbles. I have not lost my marbles. I am very lucid and clear as to what is happening to our nation. And that is why Esther, the book of Esther, is so relevant to us. Because there is a system called Haman that is trying to kill the righteousness of God, the people of God right now. There is a political regime. There is a 
policy makers. There is a globalist. There's an entire scheme of what is happening in, in the entire world that is trying to take down our United States of America. And if we are not careful, we will lose our republic. And yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God will have absolutely, absolutely, I believe that. But we will not fulfill our destiny. What do we do? What am I asking you to do? I'm at, calling for a three-day fast, starting on Tuesday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Three-day. However you want to do it, however you want to fast. But fast earnestly and pray earnestly that the veil of deceit and lie will be pulled back. And what are we fasting and praying for? For the destiny of our nation, for the destiny of our bride, for the destiny of TLC, and the destiny of our lives. We cannot walk away from what God is calling us to do. God has placed us in this very point in our time for such a time as this. It is a crucial moment in history. It is a crucial moment in the history of the church and politics of the United States. We have crossed paths now. There is an intersection that is happening. And the way we decide, the way church comes together, right, and supports the current regime, the current past president, right, the way it does that will have an impact on the outcome. I truly believe that. I am convinced that there is victory for our church. There is victory for our nation. I am convinced of that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. Father God, we ask that your will be done in this place. We ask that your truth will come in this place. We ask that you will fill us up with boldness, without fear, but with courage and with righteous in indignation that we would walk out of this place filled with holy zeal for the Lord, God, that we will be tired of living in the background, that we would come forward and bring the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ, in every way, that we would walk out the salvation that you have given us, O oh Lord. We are but a small army, and we are a battalion, maybe and just a squad, a platoon, but we know that there are other platoons and other squads and divisions that are coming together for this great battle that you have set for us, O oh Lord. And Father, we say yes to you. We say yes to the Lord of hosts, and we say yes to you, and we say do your will, do your work among us, and gear, and, and, and gear us up for the battle that you have set before us, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I am terribly sorry that I went long. There was a lot to say there, and I just kind of plow through a lot of passages there. If you have a chance, read the book of Esther. Ask the Lord wisdom and insight in the parallels uh, that are happening in our time right now. A couple announcements. December 12th is our next men's fellowship. We will meet at Pastor Joshua's house and do what men do best. Nothing. <laughs> That's not true. Month of November, we'll have testimonies, and the first testimony is um, Tobias. So we'll start that around 11.30. Um, uh, November 27th is a Friday, um, but we, won't, we will not have youth group meeting that Friday. That's th Thanksgiving um, uh, week. So we will take... Thursday, the prayer meeting, we won't have a prayer meeting, and we won't have the uh, Friday uh, youth group meeting as well, right? 
If you are joining us on Thursdays, please, if you can, if you can preferably join us on site. If not, we have Zoom meetings, and if you need an invite to the Zoom meeting, I can surely send that to you. All right. Um, Oh, the, the men's fellowship's at 1 o'clock in my house. And, and uh, please, men, if you have an opportunity, please join. All right. It will be, I have a feeling that we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. And we're going to pray and we're going to empower each other. Okay. All right. Thank you and see you guys next week. Be the church.